20th of May, 1906, Jimmy Joyce himself writes a letter that this story, after the Ivy Day story, was one of his favorite stories and the one that pleased him the most. Do you think that's because this is the most depressing one we've had so far? And we've done like death already. And this one still got me. It was also one of the later ones that he wrote. And I got to be honest, I think Joyce is one of those people that like he always looks back on the earlier works and thinks that those are just garbage compared to his latest works. <laughs> All right, that could be true. I also felt like to me, and I don't know much uh, as about Joyce as you do, uh, but I felt like this one was a little bit more personal. It felt like it hit a little bit more home on a few levels of how he's writing these two uh, gentlemen, I will say. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to go into that today. And I'm going to have to bring up Gifford here today because actually I found this rather interesting. And you can pick this this copy up, up hopefully at your library or whatever. But you'll notice that they actually mapped out their walk through Dublin. So literally the place that they started, and, you know, you shows where they're walking. They head up north and head back down is right across the street from where they ended up. So literally they walked in a gigantic circle, essentially in the story. <laughs> Very meta, man. Dang, Joyce nails it. Oh, he is so amazing. And I got to admit, this is very personal for me because a lot of those streets and like where he went, I had walked around as well, except the red light district. I didn't go there. Don't worry about that. Anyways. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the plot, we always open up with this on a Sunday in August. And it's interesting that we have the two characters, Coralie and Lenahan, two gentlemen, and I use the term loosely. That Very loosely. <laughs> that are essentially walking around Dublin and are literally told the street names left and right. I don't know if it's to recreate this map or what. But they're uh, both in their 30s, kind of struggling. They seem to be figuring out life as well as how to exploit others upon their way, including morality with women, financial woes in terms of class. It's uh it's a very interesting opening for these characters. Not one for people who like need to associate with the main character. This is one where you kind of you pass judgments upon them very easily, I feel like. Yeah, we finally get to the point where Corley is uh, talking about how he's going to take advantage of a woman and kind of exploit her. Yeah, the slavey, as they call her, which is kind of slang for a maiden, uh, a servant girl. It's a kind of like a British term, essentially. But you don't really know exactly what they're going on about because they're using so much slang in terms of like, like, oh, going about it in a family family way or does she know how to do it? Like there's a lot of questions from the reader's perspective, like for a first time reader to say, is he trying to hook up with the slavey? Is he trying to get her to do something? It's just not clear at this point in time. But they go to meet her and at first they admire her from a distance and that's when Corley heads off with her while Lenahan goes on his journey around town. And that's when you see the Gifford guard guide. He heads to the furthest north point north of the Liffey in, in Dublin, basically. That's where the refreshment bar is, which if you didn't know what a refreshment bar is, the book says it's unspecified, but it's probably a non-alcoholic establishment where you can order foods and drinks and stuff like that. They have those in Ireland? <laughs> well, they, they used to have them in um, the train stops a lot. Oh, when, okay. when you'd get off at the train that you could just get some quick refreshments and stuff like that. All right, I that do makes know sense. that part. Yeah. So, cool. so Lenahan, when he's, when he's going on this journey, he goes through this like existential crisis that we kind of, kind of have to explore where he's like, man, I wish I had a girl that could take care of me. I kind of wish I was doing better. There's, there's a strange twist in tone, even with this part of the story, in my opinion, I don't know. We'll have to get what your views are on this. But eventually, he's he's going to go back to meet Corley. Uh, Corley gets out at the arranged place, and that's where they discover that the, you know, are you going to get in with her, was that she bas he basically had her steal a gold coin, which is about six to seven weeks of pay. So a couple months of, of pay Oof. stolen. Oof. What a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that said, okay, so I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, about how we come across on these two characters because obviously there's, there's the very surface level presentation of the story is called two gallants and gallant meaning someone who's chivalrous, who I think is sweet on women is, is a Tim, you know, chivalry with women type of interpretation. And obviously it's meant to be ironic to begin with, right? Cause are these characters a gallant in the stereotypical way? Absolutely not. 
<laughs> and I've been thinking about that because, you know, when you write those characters that are the archetypes of a, a, a draining character, a character that's a drain upon others, right? In the sense that others always have to feed them. They have to put up with them or take care of them, or they're a drain on society, taking the resources and stuff like that. When writers put those in stories, it's usually setting them up for the redemption, right? Like the idea that, oh, I need to be able to pick myself up and help others and not just think about myself. That's the typical way that we see those characters. But that's clearly not, you know, what we see with Joyce. Joyce always goes a step deeper. And whether they're drunks or gamblers or, dare I say, authors, just saying, Joyce, <laughs> <laughs> you see these archetypes appear a lot in literature. A lot of times in, in literature, we have, white and black representing different, you know, levels of good and bad. And if you mix those together, gray is kind of a mix of both. And if you look at these two characters, you're, you're trying to think, all right, are they all good? Are they all bad? No, they're, they're, they feel like maybe they could be a little bit of both. And so they have this kind of wishy-washy tone to them. And as you said, I think a lot of times you want the character to be good, or we, we want to see that hero's journey. We want to see them have a redemption story, something of that nature. And, and you feel like you're almost going to get that when Lenahan goes off by himself uh, and, and he starts contemplating how bad his life is and that he, if he could just turn things around, he could be better, uh, but he needs help doing that. And of course, it ultimately doesn't happen, unfortunately, for him. So let's, let's look at it one character at a time because I'm curious how you viewed and did you view a difference in these characters? Because Corley... He's what? He is the one that's going on these exploits. He's perhaps trying to trick others or exploit others on the resources, getting her to steal. Uh, you know, in the south side of the Liffey is generally considered a little bit more posh, a little bit more upper class. And obviously she's a servant girl, so she's serving a more well-to-do family. So stealing a coin, you know, that's that's kind of like a, a drain on society, stealing from others. So Corley, to me, I kind of viewed as a trickster the character that is kind of insinuating and getting others to perhaps act upon urges or things that they want to do anyway. Yeah, I, I viewed Corley as kind of the leader of the two. I feel like he's a little bit more devious. I think that I saw Corley as someone that easy money is the only good money, that you should never have to work hard for it. He's all he, He's a schemer is who he is. And I feel like that he, he's even kind of scheming with his friend. I mean, at the end, he does show off the coin that he got it. But do you think there's going to be equal share there? Because he, quote, did the work, the minimal amount of work, and then he maybe should be in control of the money or he's the one that is going to be, uh, you know, rewarded slightly more if they, you know, break up the gold into silver or, you know, whatever they use over there quibits or something like that <laughs> so i don't know he just felt a little bit more scummy to me i definitely viewed him a little bit more negative well it'd be english money right because they're still under english rule so also worth noting that corley's father was a police officer under english thumb if you will probably don't have a lot of money and he was seen in like you know the casual clothes so he was probably a police informant so he's probably not working with a lot of money and there's even kind of like this, I didn't know how to take this because they talk about the aspiration of his name. And in the Gifford guide, it says that it's pronounced the way it's translated is with an H sound. So it'd be pronounced like Horley, like, and one could even oh. think of that as W-H-O-R-E-L-Y as in the sense of like the, the hedonism, the chase of Bacchanalia, if you will, with the drinks and the women that uh, he... Yeah, he's he's got an association mm. with perhaps more of the seedy side, and I don't think he's trying to work him way, his way out of it. Yeah, he likes being there. I think he he feels like he's thriving there. That this is the life for him. This is how you survive. This is how you thrive, and I'm okay with that. He he doesn't seem to have guilt as Lenahan does. Of maybe I could just get ahead. I can get away from this life. That's the, the small distinction between them for a slight moment. Well, in the beginning, you think they're going to be of the same ilk, right? You think that Lenahan's going to be just like him. He's egging Corley on. Uh, and he even has like that comment where he says, you know, he didn't want to appear as a leech, right? But it's once these two separate that you see less influence. You don't see the trickster influence on Lenahan anymore. 
and the tone shifts even from a writing standpoint for how Joyce writes these scenes. And you'll see that he goes into the refreshment bar, which is on the north side of the Liffey, which, you know, it's generally considered more of a working man's area, so a lot less cash and money in that spot. And he hasn't eaten since breakfast, right? And he's got kind of like a, a middle class accent. So when he orders, he specifically tries to talk down his accent. He wants to appear rougher and, and less genteel, is what the narration says. So let a hand. You know, I've seen some people describe him as self-loathing, which I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that, because to me, when we start looking at this clash discussion about, you know, we look at particularly after the race, well, how does Dublin, you know, build themselves up when they're so behind in the world stage? They're still a puppet of 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 England. Well, here we have Lenahan, who wants better. But he almost wants to kind of like, you know, drain. He wants to be the leech, like the middle class lady, just to take care of him in, in a sense. But he almost resents, I think, his class, where he resents his situation more so than he hates himself. Mm. That if he just wasn't in this situation, like if he could just be taken care of and have that wealth, he'd be happier. Is much different than saying, I hate who I am. He's saying, I hate my situation. This is where I saw... This is where my little tiny bit of knowledge of Joyce comes into play. I know that Joyce grew up pretty poor, and I think that a little bit of that could be reflected, in my opinion here, and in, in that if you had just been born in a different class, uh, you know, he's right. Your situation would be different. Uh, you know, better education, better money, better food, better everything. That is That is very true, and I think that... I don't think he's self-loathing. I think that he's throwing himself a pity party because he wasn't born to better opportunities. And I think that you can't fault him for that as a lot of us, you know, could probably relate to it saying, you know, had I been born in a different place, a different time, a different, whatever, you're going to be afforded different opportunities. And he's just kind of longing for that betterment, maybe not in a positive way, but he definitely is saying, if things change, I could have a better life and maybe I could be a better person. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but uh, it, it could be hinted at there. <laughs> well, I'll say this. I could be a better person. Like, let's break that down because it's when he's with Corley, he he is fully complicit in participating in the hedonism, in the bacchanalianism, uh, the stealing, the lecherous, you know, talking about women and trying to steal from from the wealthy class, if you will. But it's when he's not with him, he wishes he was better. And isn't that perhaps Lenahan's problem? Is, is he has some awareness of his desires, whether that's coming from a conscious, unconscious perspective. He knows he wants better than his situation. He knows exactly what he wants. But he fails to take those steps. It's, it's, like, it's like he's suppressing this idea of doing better than what he is. And we've talked about before, we, we've, there's a very specific term for that called like crab mentality. Like the idea being, you know, like a crab, if you put it <laughs> in a bucket, it technically could reach up and it's got the strength to pull itself up and walk out of that bucket. Right. And a one it's crab by its, well, one crab by itself can do that. Right. It literally could. You put a bucket of crabs in there. And as soon as one starts to reach up, Right. I don't know if it's instinctual or what the other crabs will grab that crab and pull it back down. And they call that crab mentality. The idea being is if you can't have it, then I, or if I can't have it, then you can't have it either. Right. The way that we we sabotage others and pull them back. Right. And here's where Lenahan has the choice to be the crab to pull himself out, but he allows others to constantly pull him back. He doesn't try to differentiate himself from the core of the world, the tricksters. He falls into the, the hedonism and the failure to move forward and, and well, I would call it what he, failing to achieve what he wants, right? I don't want to just say because you have more money, you're better, but that's what Lenahan wants. And he constantly chooses to do these exploits and waste time rather than move himself forward. So two things. Misery loves company. <laughs> and two, I really like this part of the story or this part of, of the entire book 
because I feel like as you talked about the adolescent years, what's one thing that we've talked a lot about throughout the whole book? Relationships and how your relationships change throughout your life, whether you know, you're know you young, middle-aged, uh, adolescent, old, whatever. And I think here we see when you're in your 30s and you're trying to maybe form those very important relationships that are going to probably last you the rest of your life. Those are going to be your, quote, best friends. This is a time that Callahan has decided that this is who I have to stick with. If I want things to be better, this is the choice that I have to make. You said Callahan. You mean Lenahan? Lenahan. Excuse me. Lenahan. That he... He's making this choice of, if I'm going to move forward, it's going to be this path, and he isn't strong enough to pull himself up. He doesn't believe in himself. He doesn't have the confidence, and he's just he's just longing, and so he'll take the easy path uh, because Corley is offering that to him with friendship to boot, which is something that we can all relate to. Yeah. From a religious standpoint, you'll notice that the, the, the slavey, she was wearing white with blue which is typically associated with Mary, right? Like the idea of purity and such. And he even convinces and corrupts her to steal upon his behalf. So it's it's very easy, I think, in, in a Dubliner's view to corrupt others. And the ability to pull yourself out of it, I think, is what's most difficult. And to your point, when you're 30s, you, you don't have the tools to do that. Or the support systems, maybe. Well, in, in Lenahan, you know, when it comes to resisting those... It's, it's very common for people to talk about how he was wearing uh, the yachting hat. He's got like a rainproof jacket, rainproof booties. Like in theory, he should be resisting, you know, mm. repelling the outside world, but he fails mm. to do that, right? So it is his choice to choose to do these sorts of things. He shielded himself with this, but still won't allow change to happen. <laughs> that's just like a 30 year old right you know right. better but you still won't do it <laughs> right well and i think and i think that's joyce's most biting criticism and perhaps why he liked dubliners so much because he loved being antagonistic but he's basically telling you guys you're holding yourselves back it's it's not you're being pulled down you're choosing to not move forward and to stay in this state of paralysis right because in the same way that their journey you know, goes from like the rich posh side to visiting the poor side. It's a loop, right? For you, you ended up where you started. You did nothing to improve or change your circumstances. And I think that's Joyce's critique of, of Dublin. Yeah. I mean, in your, your twenties, you're usually self-sabotaging your life, right? And you figure by the time you reach your thirties, you're not supposed to do that anymore. And we see here where, where Corey and Lenahan are, are just saying, well, it's our circumstances that are the fault of all these things. And we're going to do whatever we can to move up. And uh, whether that's, you know, being something shady or unsavory, they're willing to do that. Uh, and I don't know what the 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 call on that of Joyce is as, you know, uh, Dublin as a whole, but uh, he, he's obviously throwing some shade at somebody, I think, for probably things that he had to endure in his own life. And, and to me, I think he's just laying it directly on Dublin as a whole. Well, you know, whether it's started or instigated by one individual person or group, you know, when he has the, that symbolism there about the harp in terms of like when the men are walking down the street, they see the guy playing the harp, the woman has her clothes down. The harp is a symbol, is the national symbol of Ireland, right? When you look at the Guinness and it's a reversed uh, uh the, the harp there that's literally a harp that is sitting there in the Trinity College which they walk right by in the story the book of Kells and such that that harp is on display in Ireland right so for for Ireland to be the instrument that's being played by another country England in this situation and the fact that Ireland isn't doing anything to pick up their own clothes and improve their circumstances <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think he's he's throwing shade on the whole country. Yeah, that's fair. Do you think that this story is the one of the book that feels the almost like most hard hitting? I mean, he pulls no punches in this one and being the the ironic title of it all and these two very unlikable characters as the two main characters in a very I feel like important chapter and important point in the book. It it just feels so impactful to me. I don't know. Not my favorite story uh, of the book, but maybe one of the most meaningful in a very sad way. So when we get to counterparts, you'll see that to me, that's probably one of the most emotional, the most emotional draining stories of Dubliners. But this one is very sad, too, because it's 
it's if if after the race is this big picture of Ireland as a whole and the problems on the world stage, to me, we see the individual Dubliners that make up, you know, all of Dublin, how they their individual choices are what's what's making them not move forward, right? So it's one thing to blame the other countries and say we don't have the opportunities. It's another thing to see the people fail to move forward, to to move past the paralysis and to individuate uh, their subconscious desires and enact upon them. And that's 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 tough for anyone to see. So I don't know. Playlist down below for other talks with Dubliners. I hope you're enjoying the talk so far. Uh, my name's Benuna. Peace. Peace.